It takes confidence and optimism to do it. When combined with innovation and persistence, the sky is the limit. However, if you push the boundaries too far, take too many risks and fail to do the correct checks, things can turn ugly and fast. And that's what happened to OneTel, a startup telecommunications company which dared to challenge the established giants. The company flew hard, fast and high and took two famous media magnets along for the ride. But overconfidence and a lack of focus on business basics, including their accounting, saw OneTel crash back to earth. The OneTel story is a fascinating one. It entered the telecommunications market at a time of profound change. The government had committed to end Telstra's monopoly by opening up the market to new entrants. Mobile phone usage was growing rapidly and customers were looking for cheaper phones and calls. OneTel would prove to be one of the most aggressive of these new entrants. OneTel, the 100% telephone company. Well, it offered mobile, local and long distance calls and internet services and grew rapidly from nothing to become one of Australia's top 30 companies. It was incredible. It had high profile, sexy investors, attracted millions of customers with its low priced products and services and built up an instantly recognisable brand, the dude. So why did it fail? The idea of OneTel's co-founders, Jody Rich and Brad Keeling, was that they should enter this rapidly expanding telecommunications market as a reseller of Optus's services. For Optus, Telstra's main rival, the attractions were obvious. It had spent billions of dollars building a network, and what it desperately needed was customers. Here were a couple of guys offering to target young people, tradesmen, small businesses and sports clubs. A totally different market to the one Optus had been targeting. OneTel launched in May 1995. They promised their customers low rates, simple tariffs and one bill for their phone services. They had a clever billing system, a flat management structure, a catchy jingle and the dude who proved that getting a phone with OneTel was easy. They had also negotiated an amazing deal in which Optus would pay OneTel 120 bucks cash every time it activated a SIM card. OneTel grew rapidly. It couldn't sign up customers fast enough. In only five months, it had passed the first year's target of 16,000 subscribers. Within 10 months, there were 50,000 customers on the OneTel books. Sales for the first year were 65 million with a $3 million before tax profit. In year two, Optus negotiated to severely reduce the $120 cash payment system, but OneTel still managed sales of close to $150 million and a before-tax profit of $7.5 million. In 1997, OneTel introduced international and long-distance services to its portfolio and floated on the stock exchange at $2 a share, valuing the company at $208 million. Things were going so well, it was decided to expand overseas. And in January 1998, OneTel launched a global strategy to move into Europe and the United States. The dude was certainly beginning to get around. Revenues were still increasing, and in August 1998, OneTel trumpeted a profit of $9 million before tax. But OneTel took a fundamental change of direction in September 1998. It decided that it wanted to set up and have control of its own network, of its own destiny. And this meant acquiring expensive spectrum licenses. From this point on, its investors would need to dig deep. Having successfully bid $9.5 million for mobile spectrum in the major Australian cities, OneTel hit its first major snag. No cash to pay for it. It was clear to Jody Rich that he'd need access to investors with huge financial resources in order to fund his growing ambitions for OneTel. Meetings with two of Australia's media giants, News Limited and PBL, led to them agreeing to put $430 million into OneTel immediately and a further $280 million in the future in exchange for 40% of the shares. 
the share price began to rocket. The 100,000th overseas customer was signed up in May 99. A $9.8 million profit was reported at the year end and an opportunity to enter the local call market appeared. Management also decided to bid for more Australian and European Spectrum licences and build more networks. The shares again soared, one till rocketed to a market capitalisation of $3.8 billion. So how come in 2001, a mere 18 months later, the company was declared bankrupt? Well, it burnt a vast amount of money. It took money in at one end and shoved it straight out the other. It never made money. I mean, for in all the years it was a public company from November 1997, it never made a real profit. It claimed to make a profit, but it, and it was never a genuine profit. It just lost a fortune. This is where the final days of the One Till saga were played out. It's where the disgraced managing directors were sacked, it's where the corporate cops raided and found those enormous holes in the one till accounts. It's where the one till workers milled around after they heard the news to be greeted by politicians and union executives grandstanding about workers' rights against management greed. It really is where the final chapter of one till was played out. But what went wrong in the first place? The systems and the, um, the processes at OneTel were shockingly inadequate for a company of that size. It was what one guy said to me, it was a company of 3,000 people, it was run like a family business, like a fish and chip shop. That's one of the accountants inside the company said that to me. The real problem with OneTel was that they tried to build a mobile network, which involved a gamble of a billion or one and a half billion or two billion dollars, who knows what it would eventually have cost them. And they were trying to take on Optus and Telstra, who are guys with fantastically deep pockets, who have a sort of entrenched interest in the market, and they're going to make damn sure that no one takes their toys away from them. It was inevitable that everyone was going to closely focus on the published financial statements once the dot-com bubble had burst. All of a sudden, it did matter where the cash was going, and most importantly, when it was going to come back in. The inevitable end came for one till when its major investors realised just how much more money had been going out than they knew of, how much more would still need to go out, and the worst part, how much looked like it would never come back. Flight number 25. Right, Pentium 2 this time, right? Pentium 2. The major investors may have lost nearly a billion dollars between them, but other investors lost fortunes too. So have many of OneTel suppliers. OneTel employees lost their jobs and Australia lost an aggressive competitor in the telecommunications market. So what obvious lessons can we learn from OneTel's demise? Well, it seems clear Jody Rich and Brad Keeling spent too much time promoting and expanding OneTel and not enough time concentrating on its actual operations and business systems. There was inadequate business planning internal controls were poor and ethical qualities and values a little questionable. One tells accounting procedures were undermined. The basics of business were treated in a cavalier fashion. They lost sight of their cash flow and financial performance. They failed to manage receivables and liabilities. Very expensive mistakes to make. 